Let's follow our discussion of momentum with this discussion of learning rate, and we'll see in some heuristic way how the two are connected. So this learning rate starts at the background, and there's the background at the beginning. It's starting to sound like a broken record, but it's really important. Uh, in the center, we have the momentum term added right here. Now, can we optimize epsilon and equivalently eta times uh, one minus beta? And you can see there's a typo there. It's not one minus minus beta, so get rid of this minus sign here. It's just one minus beta. Can we optimize epsilon and eta? And this is not a trivial problem, but we're going to explore it a little bit so you get some geometrical intuition as to what's involved here. Let's look at the learning rate. It could be too low or too high. Either one wastes time training and wastes resources. Too low, too long. Too high, inaccurate. Too low and too high can cause increased cloud GPU costs, CPU costs, transmission, so resources washed out. Not good. This is a current problem. Desirable learning rates attacked at many different fronts for over the last, I would say, 25 years. Unfortunately, tuning is real hard. Why? Because the multidimensional loss function is very jiggly. It can have rough things, saddle points, ravines, bulges, everywhere, and you're in an n-dimensional space, and remember, n could be in the billions, so you can't even see it. And again, different weights have different rates. Don't forget that. That's a big mess. It means that some parts of our valley and our mountains will be, of the loss function will be differentially sensitive to the weightings that we pick. Okay, so we're going to look at a heuristic here, and I'm going to draw it in the uh, next slide. One of the things when you're looking at learning rates, don't train the entire data set first. It's too costly. Do a learning rate test. So what you do is you choose a sample of data, say one mini batch. By the way, mini batches from the literature should not be greater than 32. There's a lot of discussion. It's another hyperparameter. You choose a min and max rate. So it's usually logarithmic. So we'll start with uh, a min rate of 10 minus 7 and a max rate of order 10 minus 1. You train it for a few epochs and look at the errors linearly increasing as you change the rate. And what's going to happen is the error, you start at min, get an error, an accuracy, and then raise it and raise it and raise it until you go to max. The question is, how fast do you raise it? So there's a heuristic and the paper reference is given by Leslie Smith. So it's rather new, it's 2015. And here's the heuristic. So you start out with a, a max, that's for eta, so eta max, eta min, and you do a cyclic thing that looks like this. And the step size, this is the step size, call it. And how do we get the step size? Well, for your given, you take the number of training images, and you divide by the mini batch size. And this will give you the number 
of iterations per epoch And usually you take the step size two to ten times number of iterations. Usually you pick two. That gives you the step size going back and forth from max to min. And the number of cycles that you pick, and those details can be looked uh, on in the paper reference that I've given. So most of the paper references are rather new. There is some of the paper references that are rather old, and we'll see that later. But Certainly for the last 25 years, the learning rate is a big problem and not something you want to sort of delve into yourself. You've got to use these heuristics, and we'll talk a little more about that in the next slides, so you don't waste time. I think one of the things to consider when we're looking at learning rates is that don't use the whole data set, it's really important because the learning rate choice will determine how long it takes to train your network and get good results and good generalizations. Uh, the learning rate, by the way, is such a difficult problem that some research groups have decided to use gradient-free methods. So, you have a loss function and you want to minimize it, the choice is to use what are called um, statistical methods such as simulated annealing or most recently particle swarm optimization which you can look up. Here are some of the points to look at, uh, the, the papers. And uh, you can see that uh, this, this most recent paper is just in June 2019. We'll talk about clipping a little bit later in this series of videos. Now, we turn to momentum. Momentum is coupled with learning rate. Learning rate determines how fast you go in the gradient, so let's do this. And we're going to do it graphically, and it's really nice. So let's look at the momentum equation, the first one. And you can see in the momentum equation that you just have, uh, this is our momentum term. And as we saw in discussion with the Newton's model, it's second order. But it can be shown, and that's an exercise for you, that this is equivalent to this coupled system. So you can see that the second equation is just the delta WT, the change in the weights, and the first equation involves momentum and gradient. So mu and zeta can be written in terms of our other definitions, beta and eta. And if we return to the two expressions here, you can see that if you substitute in for v of t plus 1, the change in w, delta omega of t, is the sum of two vectors. So we have a vector that's a change in the weights, sum of two vectors. We know how to add two vectors, so let's do it in the next slide. So we start with W of t. And there are two terms. The gradient is written in the previous slide in terms of g, including the minus sign. So here's W of t, and we have a vector that represents the gradient of W of t. 
Now, the second term that we add to V that we're going to use is going to be what? W to W of T, you're going to add two terms that, get, that is part of V of T plus one. And this one is going to be mu V T. So we can use the parallelogram rule for adding vectors. So here's our sum that takes us to w of t plus 1. And this vector, of course, is just the change vector on w of t having the two components, the gradient component and the momentum component. What could be simpler? Well, let's look at this again in a slightly different setting. I'm going to have to erase this, but I'll say the speech before I erase it. We're, we're calculating, in the old way, we're calculating W of t and then applying the gradient here. But what else could we do? Let's see, here's the picture. And the idea. Very clever idea. It was developed by a fellow called, you can see his title in the top, Nesterov. So, I'll move this down. W of T. Well, the first thing we do is let's pretend we don't know what the gradient is. So let's do the momentum first. The momentum update is this. Before, we calculated the gradient at WT. But let's calculate the gradient at this new updated point and that gradient vector, say, might be here. So this will be w of t plus 1, and that, that's where we go. And this gradient is evaluated at what? It's not evaluated at wt anymore, but we went this extra distance. Got to put the vectors in here. So this technique is called what? It's the gradient at the new position incremented by the momentum. After we move the momentum position, then we get the gradient, and hence the term. We're not, we're not looking at the mu v of t anymore, uh, the, the, just the w of t. We're looking at the, the gradient at this new position. And what that does is that if we're going in the wrong way with the momentum term, this term will tend a little bit, not a lot, to correct us to point back to where we started from. You can see it from the figure. It's just a slight push back in this diagram. I mean, maybe it'll end, WT will end up over here. It's very slight. But when you're doing lots and lots of iterations, as noted below in the paragraph, the effects are cumulative. So this is a really cool idea. So we have momentum and we have Nesterov. And we will see how the two combine later when we talk about one of the hottest op optimizers called Atom. So I'll erase this. It's really interesting that two-dimensional geometry can really help us a lot in understanding how to proceed in terms of descent. And my percep perception is that the 
the work that we're doing right now is, is not trivial. It requires visualization, linear algebra, calculus, and I haven't mentioned a lot. There's a lot of probability involved, and we'll see that when we talk about Adam. So let's look at comparing Nesterov and classical momentum. In Nesterov, good directions of the gradient descent are rewarded, and bad directions are slightly penalized. NAG does better direction corrections. It's not obvious that NAG accelerates descent where the lost surface curvature is well behaved. So NAG does a great job there. That's geometrical proofs about rotating eigenvectors in the principal curvature directions. Now, in summary here, there's been a lot of work done on the curvature of these lost surfaces. The matrix, the Hessian matrix, essentially is a matrix of second derivatives that defines the curvature. So it would be nice to have HF methods, Hessian free methods, and there's a re rather good article written by James Martin, Deep Learning via Hessian Free Optimization. And that's it for NAG and CM.